we're going to talk today about the treatment of small leg veins, that's both leg telangiectasias and leg reticular veins by sclerotherapy. Um, in some parts of the world, this is described as microsclerotherapy because we use small doses of sclerosant and we use a very fine needle. In other parts of the world, there's no distinction between the sclerotherapy of bigger veins and the sclerotherapy of um, these sorts of veins that we're gonna talk about today. But uh, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to refer to it as microsclerotherapy. And um, there are lots of there are lots of uh, contentious issues and areas of not disagreement and uh, but but areas where people have different views about how to treat spider veins. And uh, I've got Simon Hobbs and Zola Mazimba, who I've known for many years, and they're both uh, fully trained vascular surgeons. Uh, who have uh, practices that include the treatment of small veins, uh, such as spider veins and blue veins on the legs. So uh, I'd like to start perhaps with you, Simon. Um, how much of your practice do you think is um, involved in the treatment of small veins? And, and how bothersome are they to the patients that you see, would you say? I think it's a large proportion of the practice. Um, I have a number of patients who present simply with spider veins as their main feature, but many of the patients that I treat with for varicose veins also have associated spider veins or thread veins that they're keen to have treated as part of their, their sort of whole venous intervention. Um, so I would probably say 70% of those with varicose veins have associated with spider veins um, and many of those have probably at least one round of sclerotherapy often as part of their their primary procedure but um, I'd probably say 30% of patients come purely with spider veins as their as their presenting feature. Wow and of those 30% that you see just with spider veins how many of those do you suspect they have a, a more serious or perhaps more underlying issue? That's a good question. Uh, I do scan them all. Um, the, I, don't, I don't necessarily do a full scan on all of them, but I will certainly scan any associated truncal veins in the, in the vicinity just to make myself confident that there is no underlying problem. Um, it's difficult to put a figure on it, but there is not, it's not an insignificant number who you find unexpected truncal reflux. Um, without associated varicose veins to, mm. to, to, to highlight, highlight that. Mm. Um, so I, th I, think, I think a scan is, is a useful adjunct to the assessment of them. Mm. So it, does that reflect your practice, Zola? Are you finding the same sort of distribution yeah. or is that your experience? I think my practice is probably slightly less. I've got, as it were, a, a big varicose vein practice and a lesser thread vein practice. Now, certainly of the people who come primarily with thread veins to me, it's probably in the region of 10, 20%. A bit like Simon, you know, I, I would scan everyone. And of those people who I see, you again, you probably find 50% of these people don't have truncal reflux. So yes, you go ahead and treat the thread veins primarily. But certainly where I'm practicing, I've got a couple of colleagues and there are other practitioners who offer microsclerotherapy. So certainly almost in a way the, the, the pool is diluted slightly. So, so based on what you, Simon, have said and what you have said, Zola, it appears that you are fairly liberal in your approach to using a duplex ultrasound scan in patients who, when you look at their legs carefully, you think they've just got spider veins. Would that, would that be a, a correct or I accurate character? I, I, I don't think, I, don't think I, I always was. I think when I first started out, I would be much more liberal in just putting people forward for sclerotherapy. But when you start to see some complications or some um, poor results or say poor results, results that aren't quite what you'd expect, it's often due to the presence of underlying um, venous reflux. And actually uh, I've now got to the stage where I'd like to identify that beforehand. What we do about it is, is, is another dilemma really because often patients who come with just spider veins don't necessarily want to suddenly fork out a lot of money to have their truncal reflux addressed. That's often a, quite a bridge too far. Yes. Um, 
often the truncal reef veins that are refluxing are on the smaller side. Yes. And um, whilst I will discuss um, radio frequency ablation or venaseal with them, quite often we'll end up just doing sort of a cheaper foaming option for their, their truncal reflux. It's um, interesting. Isn't and it? it's, it's interesting. A lot, a lot of that does boil down to things. I think cost, cost for the patient. Yes, I think I think this is an area of controversy, isn't it, Zola? I remember you raising a point at one of the meetings you and I attended together. Uh, what if what if the pattern of reflux is outside the distribution of the spider veins? Um, for example, should everyone who's got spider veins on the lateral part of their thigh should they should they have a complete ultrasound scan of the leg, or should they have a very focused one? Um, do they need an ultrasound at all? Could they have, for example, uh, imaging with a vein light, uh, transillumination device? Would that be sufficient if you saw a small vein on the lateral part of the thigh in association with spider veins? Would that identify a reticular vein that could be treated by uh, transillumination guided uh, liquid sclerotherapy? What, what, what's your view on this, Zola? Yeah, I think it's a difficult situation. But I think the more information you have, the better a conversation you can uh, you can have with the patient. Also, the better you can pre try and predict as best you can the outcomes. I mean, I've certainly found since starting out, and we all remember the sort of as you were the you know the Generation One white sonocytes that were sort of you know sort of you saw crackles and a bit of a, a bit of a circle that was a vein and maybe some reflux. To now, the scans that are available at the moment and the high frequency probes that you get with them it's now amazing how much you see. And actually, it's not so much the vessel or seeing a vessel in proximity, it's the dynamics of that vessel. So certainly the only way to actually know, is this a pathological vessel, is can you demonstrate reflux? So I must admit, I, I, I've very much gone to the, I will scan everyone. I will scan everyone because I think it gives me as much information as I, as I can possibly have. And then a bit like as Simon says, there are those patients that just want their thread veins injected and that's all they want injected. Well. You know what, providing I feel it's reasonable and I can advise them that, look, this is what I see. This is what I would recommend if you want the best results and the best chance of longevity. However, if you just want B, then that's fair enough. Greater chance of recurrence, etc. But certainly at least you can have that conversation and come to the decision. So, yes, I, I now scan it. I now scan everyone and pretty much scan, not just localized. I, I, I will scan the leg when they come in. Very interesting because uh, just to put the counter argument, because obviously all three of us are vascular specialists, or I'm, I'm a phlebologist, I only treat veins now, and I think you just treat veins, don't you, Zola? Um, we are very fortunate, the three of us, to have access to ultrasound within our clinic as part of our consultation. Uh, all three of us use an ultrasound in the way that we might have a stethoscope in our pocket. Um, you wouldn't think of... Uh, being a respiratory physician without a stethoscope, we are we treat veins and we have a, a portable ultrasound in the in the clinic. The counter argument, of course, is that many of our colleagues, both doctors and nurses, don't have access to duplex ultrasound, and they can treat carefully selected patients and get very good results without access to duplex, provided they know the contraindications. And some would argue. In fact, many of our colleagues on the British Association of Sclerotherapists Board uh, would argue that if you're experienced and you go through a carefully conducted history and examination, you don't necessarily need to scan everyone. That's one counter argument. The other counter argument is treat the patient, not the scan. Um, you're right, the scans are so good these days. We can see veins, so-called feeder veins, reticular veins, that may not be of importance. They may not really actually change the outcome, whether you treat them or not. Um, so I think it's a difficult area. I, I tend to be on your side, I have to say, but I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that very experienced practitioners get very good results when they know how to take a proper history, examine, um, and perhaps screen patients out with a continuous wave doctor examination. Simon, you're a very modern vascular surgeon. You probably don't remember the handheld Doppler screening test for a for varicose vein. Those. You do, um, and I even had to learn the tourniquet test for my, <laughs> my yes. exam as well. But uh, I've never used this in practice. 
Do you think do you think there still might be a place for suitably trained doctors and nurses who have a handheld Doppler to use that to screen out unsuspected reflux that might be important? I think it's a useful test, isn't it? Really, I think I, I certainly use that throughout most of my training, and I think you do you can pick up trunk or reflux quite well with a handheld Doppler, provided you obviously know where you're listening for. Exactly. Um, exactly. And obviously it's trying to screen out the other patients who perhaps would trigger you to, to want to do a formal scan, those with skin changes, those with yes. associated varicose veins, um, those with significant sort of um, veins around the ankle, uh, that yes. ankle flare. I think those are the ones where your likelihood of finding something more significant is yes. that much higher to warrant doing a more formal scan. Yes. Okay, so I think I think we're all agreed on patient selection and and history examination and and perhaps some special investigations, um, and maybe we could propose that for some patients a selective policy for referral for a duplex scan would be appropriate. So um, tell and, me, and, and, and this, this 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 is probably an area where those people who trust or nurses or cosmetic practitioners to do them be quite good for them to have an association or have a link with a, a local vascular yes. specialist who can offer advice and guidance and perhaps offer that service. Yes, I think that's very important. I agree. Yes. I think it's important to know, A, when to refer, if the patient really wants to take this thing further, uh, and B, who to refer to. And as you say, having a link with a local vascular specialist is very important for doctors and nurses who perhaps don't have access to in the investigations that uh, us, the three of us do. So um, let's imagine a situation now in which the patient has no reflux, suitable for sclerotherapy, and you're going to perform the treatment. Um, what, what sclerosis do you use, Zola? Uh, I recently, or relatively recently changed. I was traditionally, when I, when I started out, I was always using fibrovane. So from that point of view, um, I would use fibrovane at either the 0.2% or dilute or, or dilute down um, the 0.5 to 0.25. Um, so I've, I would use fibrovane and had been using that for years. And then uh, ethoxy sclerol came out. Ironically, I, I like the right of it. The fact that this thing was meant to have been a local anesthetic originally and actually they were trying to persuade me it had less complications and less risk of ulceration. So I switched to ethoxysclerol and have been using that ever since. And it's my, yeah, my scrolls of the choice now. I'm very happy with it. Good. What about you, Simon? I think I'm exactly the same. I think when I first started out, it was fibrovane because that was really all that was available, uh, both on the NHS and in the private sector. Um, and it's been the last probably 18 months I've changed over to ethoxysclerol um, and I've carried on using that. I, I think the results are a bit better. I think I've seen less staining or brown discoloration um, with that than I do with I did with the fibrovane. Although I still I do still use fibrovane for um, some of the larger veins. I still I still haven't moved away from fibrovane for treating sort of larger truncal truncal veins. If I were to to use foam for that. Um, so yeah, I think both both of you are in very good company worldwide. Ethi ethoxysclerol um, is is the most popular sclerosant, and uh, certainly in uh, talking to colleagues, the majority of them, probably more than 60, 70, 80 percent, use uh, ethoxysclerol, ethoxysclerol or polydocanol. Uh, I have to say that I use. Um, sodium tetradecyl sulfate fibrovane. I use 0.1%. What, what strength do you use, uh, Zola, of ethoxysclerol? I use the 2.5 or I dilute, uh, or dilute that down to 1. Point, uh, to 1.25. I think as with everything, it's a case of as time's gone on, I've suddenly realized or you, you get to realize the more you do that you know, sometimes less is more and actually yeah. it's, getting, it's getting the sclerosant in the right place rather mm. than pumping the dose up and up and up. So yes. certainly, I, I, I would certainly for yeah, sort of for very fine things on the skin, I'd use one point two five. Um, if I'm injecting into a reticular vein, I'd, I'd use two point five. Yes, just to clarify, most people when they're talking about concentrations would say point five percent or point two five. Is that what you mean, Zola? 
I mean, point, yeah, well, yeah. 0.25 percent, yeah, yeah, 0.25 percent, yeah. Okay, so we we um, we we use different sclerosins. I'm outvoted two to one. What about um, any trick? Any tips for injecting the telangiectasias themselves? Let's start with telangiectasias. Um, any tricks or tips, uh, Simon, for injecting spider veins? What's your what's your sequence of events? Good lighting, good lighting. Um, um, I will offer, for smaller veins, I often will use a magnifying light. So a, um, a light on a stand with a magnifying, with a halo light around it. Yes. And those lights are good. You've got to be careful with some lights. Some lights um, make visualization a bit more tricky, especially of the slightly deeper reticular veins. You find often sort of um, operating lights, for instance, tend to reflect off the skin. Yes. You don't tend to see the veins as well. Often ambient light is a bit better for those. Yes. So for the very fine, but I use the smallest needle I can get my hands on, which is usually a 30 gauge yellow needle. Yes. I use a, a two and a half mil syringe. Uh, syringe choice is important. Um, I, tend, I can't remember, the, I, think, I think it's the Braun Emerald. It's, it's the one with the green, the green plunger. Some of the blacker black plungers, the lubricant in it, um, is tricky, it's particularly if you want to foam it. It doesn't form a very stable foam. Yes. Whereas the green emerald um, does form a very nice foam. Right. For very fine veins, I tend to use neat liquid, and for for larger masses, I, I will I will then um, use use a bit of foam. Right. I bend the needle, um, and the amount I bend it, I think, depends on how deep the vein is. For deeper reticular veins, I don't bend it as much, but for ones that are just under the skin, I bend the needle quite significantly because you really want to be coming into the skin sort of really sort of quite a, quite a fine angle to, to get it. Otherwise, you're quickly through and beyond the vein. And do you apply a little pressure as you're puncturing the skin or do you just see, feel when you're in and then put a bit of pressure on? For the very fine veins, I'll tend to start to inject just before I get into the skin. Almost, almost get a yes. like little little bead out of, yes. out of the end of the needle. Yeah. And then as soon as you're you're in or partly in, you then see it blanch and you stop advancing and continue yes. to inject. I think if you wait until you to inject after you've gone through the skin, you've often gone a bit too far in. Yes. Especially the very very fine skin telangiectasias. Yes. So, Le, you've got some tips, I think, haven't you? Yeah. Well, telangiectasias. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I, I would do a lot of things that Simon Simon does. I sort of find using a watch called using an LED headlight is sort of in, in ways helps me in a lot of places because certainly dependent on the rooms that you're in, the, the lighting quality is variable, etc. But actually, you know, sort of with these LED headlights that you can put on, it gives you a very clear light, and you can actually you, know, can, you actually dim it down or increase it as necessary. Again, I do bend the needle slightly. Um, my yeah, my preferred my preferred thing is actually to to get some sort of what's called cross polarization. So to use polarized light because that certainly reduces the reflection off the skin. So actually, you, you do you, you tend to get a much clearer or to me it seems a much clearer picture of the vessel itself. And then again, as Simon says, it's sort of it's surprising how superficial and how not very far in these things are so certainly you know sort of a lot of the time you go too far and too deep so as yes. it were almost in a way i mean sort of one of my colleagues almost sort of talks a bit as simon's described he sort of calls it as it were the capillary suck that he sort of tries to create so he sort of as it were a bit like simon he puts the bead on and then actually yes. just sort of as he goes through it's, it's almost not so much the pressure of him injecting he describes it as sort of you know, just the capillary pull yeah, sort of, yeah, bringing the screws in, then, then you know you're at the right point. Yes. Reticular veins, Simon. Any tricks or tips for reticular veins? Do you hunt for them, first of all? Do you, do you actively go looking for uh, reticular veins? Or do you just, if you see one nearby, do you inject it or do you actually formally hunt for it? And how do you hunt for it, the reticular veins? I've used, I've used the vein lights. Um, I, I do use that. Uh, intermittently, I would say. I think if, when you have a, a leaf shaft fed veins in the calf, they're often associated with particularly. I will go and look for those. For little isolated telangiectasias, I won't necessarily unless they're obviously there. Um, the vein light I've, I, I find tricky. Um, 
it's largely because of, because of the light that it that it generates. I, I get a bit of almost a bit of snow blindness after mm. using it, which I find a tricky thing to go and deal with some of the telangiectasias. Mm. Um, but I think it is good for visualizing some of the slightly deeper reticular veins, especially with um, certain skin skin colors. Yes. Very, very pale skins, you can often see the reticular veins quite nicely without it. But as as um, the skin becomes more tanned, it's, it is, can be more and more difficult. Yes. Um, slightly deeper than, than the t dentitis, so I don't tend to angle the needle quite as much. Um, and for larger ones, I would try and aspirate us a bit yes. before before um, before injecting, just to make sure that I was, I was in. But normally, again, if you go if you go if you do inject slowly, you can you can see when the vein starts to clear once when when, when you've got intraluminal, especially if yes. you're using foam. Yes. Sorry, Zola, I may not have left you anything to say about reticulus. What? No. Well, you know, a bit like Simon. I agree. I mean, I used to use, I still have a vein lights as well. I've got a couple of vein lights. I use them, I think they're good, but I think, as you say, you do, you get this glare off them. So certainly after you've dealt with the reticular vein, you then actually need to wait for a while for your eyes to adjust before you can, before you can inject anything further, more superficial. Yeah. Um, I've, I, I use it, I've got an Accuvane, had an Accuvane for quite a while. Yes. I like it, but I find it's difficult while you're actually treating it's great to map things out but i mean uh, my problem is the moment you then try and come across with a needle or your finger you cast a shadow and so you can't see anything and both the acuvane and the vein light have got the same issue it's a case of they show you there's a reticular vein but you get no concept of the depth or uh, sort of where this thing is mm -hmm. so i've actually you know since, since i upgraded the scanner in fact on your recommendation are in now have a high frequency probe my go-to is, is, is the 18 megahertz high frequency probe, because certainly I can visualize reticular veins on ultrasound. It shows me exactly the depth. I can then cannulate under ultrasound control. I know convincingly that I'm in the vessel and I can watch as the foam carries on along the vessel, sort of almost, you, you know you're in the right spot even before you then start seeing the blanching, et cetera, because you know this is traveling up the vein or hold it, it's extravasating. I need to move away and come somewhere else. So I would use a high frequency ultrasound probe. Yeah, mm. almost, well, that's my go-to tool now. That's your go-to, yes. It's very, I have to say, it's very reassuring, or very nice, isn't it, when you inject a reticular vein that you've found near a, patch of telangiectasias and then having injected the reticular vein you see the telangiectasias blanch mm. it, sometimes it it means that you don't need to directly inject the telangiectasias that's really good i mean go go on that for I me mean, that's that's interesting because I, mean, I would tend to use a slightly stronger solution for the reticular veins would you be concerned about a stronger solution then coming into your telangiectasia which you might feel be a bit a bit too strong for those telangiectasias Good point. Good point. I hadn't thought of that. Well, I have thought about that. I, I, I use the same. I use the same. What do you do, Zola? Uh, the thing is, I, I tend to use 0.1% um, STS for reticular veins and telangiectasias. Uh, very occasionally, I will use foam for reticular veins, but usually now it's liquid. And I'm going for the more frequently less strength rather than more strength, depending on the size. I think reticular veins and spider veins you can treat, I can treat with 0.1%. I may need to see them one more time, but I think you probably get fewer issues if you do it that way. Um, that's what I think I do. The team that support me in the clinic may tell you something different. They may say, he says that, but he's always injecting foam. If I do inject foam, it's 0.1% foam. It's not 0.2%. Um, so we've injected the spider veins, we've injected the reticulars, we're expecting a great result. Stockings. Zola, I'm gonna give you first crack at this and we'll leave Simon little to say afterwards. What do you do with stockings, Simon, um, Zola? Stockings, stockings a bit like concentrations of sclerosants. Um, I, I'm using less and less of it as time goes on. When I first started out, it was a case of, you know, sort of stockings day and night for, you know, two weeks or so. Um, and I've slowly retracted back from that. I haven't quite reached the point where I'm sort of confident, although I do, I have been to a few talks and heard a few people who would, who would argue fairly reasonably that actually, you know, what, is there a role for stockings at all? And it just increases the cost. 
I mean, my current policy is now I put people in a, in a Royal Class 2 stocking, let's say 48 hours, day and night, and then just during the day for the remaining five days. So essentially they've got a week of stockings and then discard the stocking, um, as opposed to it used to be two weeks day and night when I first started out. If you had this conversation with me in 18 months time, it'll probably be less. Simon, what do you do with regard to I still I still use, use compression. Um, why? I think probably my, my first patients were ex-patients of retired colleagues. And they, they were used to coming every six months and having their legs bandaged up. And that's what they expected to, to happen. So I think I certainly sort of fell in suit there. And I, I, I do tend to use payer haft bandages. I think that's a very nice um, compliant yes. bandage, which is which with, a, with, with a bit of eccentric compression. So yes. I use some gauze. Um, and I've moved some more towards using the sort of the surgical Raytec gauze because it's a bit firmer than than normal gauze. It does act so. So certainly with larger veins and some large reticular veins, I would yes. put some payer haft on with a TED stocking over the top. Out of habit, I still put people in TED stockings following thread vein treatments as well. But I think increasingly it's becoming clear the evidence is is not as as robust as it were and, and probably we can do without compression for a number of these patients partly it it, it, it hides the vein away um <laughs> veins always look a bit worse to start with you do get a bit of bruising from the injection site so it does sort of keep that out of sight for for a week or so whilst the vein's settling down so there may be some psychological benefits from hiding them away um but whether they improve outcome it's i think it's it's not clear really it's very difficult very difficult. What about uh, routine two-week appointments, Zola? Yeah, I must hold my hands up to this one. I think it's a good suggestion. I see the argument, I see the results, etc. I don't currently. You don't do it. Bring no. people back routinely at two weeks. Um, if somebody thinks, yeah, if somebody thinks there's a there's a problem or something, look, yeah, or they have a concern, then yes, I'll see people early at any stage, but. Mm. Uh, at, at the moment, I just logistically, it's just, it doesn't suit the way I'm practicing at the moment to bring, to, to bring everyone back in two weeks. Simon? I agree. I think it's, I think it's difficult to, to fit into the business plan and uh, at, the, at the current price point to bring everyone back. It doesn't suit everyone to come back at two weeks. Anyway, all these people are often younger, working, it's yes. difficult to get time off to come to a clinic. Yes. But I do give them instructions that you know, if any particular vein becomes sort of hard and lumpy or red and inflamed or looks dark or is sore to get back in touch and I'll, I'll see them. I must say, if I do from back to me, I tend to do it as about four, four weeks or so rather than two. Once I've done it two weeks, maybe the bigger veins, I don't, I found it that the thrombus hasn't quite liquefied enough to, to get it out. I, I, my view is that they've probably done better about, about, about four weeks. Okay. Um, Interesting. The good thing about microsclerotherapy is there's no right or wrong answer because there's a real lack of randomized prospective studies and uh, everyone's experience is different. Everyone's population group is different. Everyone's age group is different. And um, uh, I think, you know, I can't, I can't argue. I do see, see people routinely at two weeks. Um, I'm very lucky in that my colleague, Kathy McGuinness, comes regularly to the practice and I've been able to learn a lot from her. Um, nearly everything that I do in my practice, Kathy does the exact opposite. So um, she doesn't use compression hosiery for anyone pretty much. She doesn't look or hunt for or inject reticular veins separately. Um, she doesn't routinely see people for thrombectomy and she has a very open policy, come back and see me when you want. Uh, and she gets great results. Um, she has a, a very large uh, microsclerotherapy practice treating small veins in the southeast of England. And the patients who come and see her in Dorset at our clinic love her. They love her because there's no stockings involved. That's not what Mr. Gadraj used to do. Um, he doesn't bring them back at two weeks and try and uh, evacuate a th micro thrombus by a painful needle, uh, like Mr. Gadraj used to do. And um, 
she's very quick because she doesn't hunt for things and she injects um, what she can see, but she is extremely skilled. And she's one of the course directors on the hands-on course that we run. Um, so um, you've, you've very kindly, before this Zoom meeting, sent me some photographs, which um, I will show uh, as you're talking about them. Um, I'll start with you, Zola. You sent some very nice photographs. Let me see if I can get them up on the screen. Um, the first one that you sent was uh, a side-by-side -side photograph of a patient's ankle. Uh, the photograph on the left looks like a very large patch of very fine telangiectasia around the ankle. And then the photograph on the right shows very little to see at all. It looks like a completely different foot, ankle. Tell, tell us a little bit about that uh, case study that you sent. Yeah, uh, this is a lady who, well, in fact, she had, she had recurrent varicose veins um, and she had quite a few varicosity throughout both legs. So she, she had a number of treatments for trunk um, reflux and also some perforators, which uh, we did TRLOP on. And she'd had some foam to, to the, the remnants of the trunks as well. Sorry, say TRO, say that again. TRLOP trollop, transluminal oh, right. occlusion of a, a perforator. So put a little laser fiber into the into the perforator to occlude it. Um, and actually, varicostis or recurrent varicostid had all disappeared. And I personally was quite quite pleased with the way the results were looking, but actually she didn't seem happy at all. And then once we got rid of all the reflux, um, she was now when can I get rid of these flare veins? And so, uh, yeah, so once the reflux was, reflux had been dealt with, uh, did microsclerotherapy. And actually this was just, this was the, she had one course, one, one, one set of injections and that was the result that she got. And it was about the only time I, I saw this lady smile, but she, she did leave happy, but it was sort of a case of, you know, sort of the extended hours of treating the trunks um, didn't satisfy Neil as much as the, uh, 20, 30 minutes injecting the ankle. Just, um, just a comment for some of our colleagues who perhaps are not vascular specialists. Um, it's clear, isn't it, if you saw somebody with those, with that ankle flare, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't see them for microsclerotherapy. Ankle flares would, would indicate that you need to very carefully look for varicose veins. Were these varicose veins very obvious, Zola? Would you, did they? They were. She, they she, were. I mean, she, yeah, she, I mean, she first case, she, she first presented when she presented the legs, she had significant bulges, um, significant varicosities on both legs. And actually that's what sort of yeah, drew, drew, her, drew, drew our attention first. And that's what we were dealing with. But actually, as you got to know the ladies, as you treated her, yes, she didn't like the bulges on the legs, but actually she, she hated the flare, vein, flare, veins, or flare, flare veins around the ankle. And yes. so certainly that's, yes, yeah, sort of, it sort of transpired that that's probably what annoyed her the most, the ankles, but she presented initially with the uh, recurrent varicose veins. So uh, uh, one of our clinician colleagues who would, would do a history and examination would know that that patient is excluded from microsclerotherapy and needs further investigation. You've also sent us uh, a, a very nice set of photographs of what looks like the left lower third of thigh from a posteromedial view, there's a nasty cluster of telangiectasias there to see. Yeah. And the photograph on the right looks like there's just some residual brown discoloration. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah, again, this, this is a lady who had, well, again, she'd had a combination. She'd had some recurrent varicose veins, which we dealt with by way of laser, but then she had a couple of areas of the thread veins that she that she found unsightly. So certainly, again, she'd had her trunks lasered. Now, certainly the, the trunks that were lasered on this thigh, there was, there was nothing in close proximity to this set of thread veins. Um, but then after we dealt with her recurrent varicose veins, um, she underwent microsclerotherapy to that. This is actually the end of two sessions. Two so sessions. She, she'd, uh, she, she'd had two sessions of microsclerotherapy. And although, as you sort of said, there's a slight area that you can still see, but she was satisfied with the result. And that yes, it's very nice. Tell me, uh, what's the time interval between the photograph on the left and the photograph on the right? How long is that? That time interval is just over six months. I actually normally leave people for I, I leave people for three months be, between because I mean certainly you treat 
they look worse than they do. They look worse initially, and then as time goes on, they start, they start to settle down. So I generally have a three month policy. I'll, I'll yeah. perform microsclerotherapy. I will see at any time if there's an issue, but I won't retreat again until we've hit th- until we hit three months. That's very nice, Simon. You've sent some nice photographs, and uh, very kindly, you've sent us a photograph of a complication. This looks like the lateral aspect of the right calf and I can see a cluster of spider veins with some quite significant brand discoloration. What tell us about that patient and what happened there? Um well this is a lady who I think was probably early on in my experience and um she actually had quite a nasty um sort of leash of thread veins there which have significantly improved with one round of steroid therapy but as you can see it's left her with quite a nasty brown discoloration. Um, I'm seeing a lot less of that now as my practice has evolved. And I suspect in part it's, it's due to evolving technique. I think when I first started out, I was much too aggressive with the concentrations of fibre vein that I use. And I suspect I probably use 0.5% fibre vein for this, yes. which is clearly much too, much yes. too strong. And it's something you, know, you and I, as we discussed, wouldn't dream of using for this type of vein anymore. Mm. Um, you can also get you also get the impression looking at sort of the last aspect of the knee that there is a sort of uh, sort of blue reticular vein sort of feeding down into this. Yes. Um, and I think uh, um, na- if I was treating her nowadays, I'd be looking to inject that as the first yes. part of the treatment before then addressing the the right. thread veins. So these that, brown would... things are are annoying, but they they on the on the whole do fade with time, and and, and a lot of them do resolve, although a small percentage of them are permanent. But most people, if they do get them, do find that they are less unsightly than the veins that were there to start with. And yeah. they can be more easily concealed with concealers and such like. But it's also it's nice to not get them. Yes. I think even with good techniques, you will get the odd patient with, with staining. Yes. Um, but hopefully they will, they will um, sort of resolve with time. Yes. That's very nice. Thank you. Uh, not many people um, would share that result because um, as you say, it, it uh, is quite significant to you know, brown marks. Having said that, Simon, we all get brown marks, all practitioners yeah. get brown marks. Uh, I tell my patients that they're inevitably going to get a brown mark. Nobody has ever come back to my clinic complaining that they haven't got a brown mark. Um, so it's a pretty safe thing to say, you're gonna get yeah. a brown mark. Um, and I think it's quite nice to have a sort of file of photographs that you can yes. show patients. A, perhaps show them how the veins might progress over the course of six months of treatment, yes. but also some of the, the smaller side effects that you might get. You say, look, would you be happy if this happened to you, if it got rid of your veins? Yes. And a lot of them say, well, actually, you know what, that's, that's still better than the veins that were there. Yes. Um, and um, photographs are very powerful, um, particularly with thread veins, which are largely a cosmetic procedure you're looking to improve the appearance of things and having having photographs especially taking photos before and afterwards and patients who come back to you it's very nice to look back at their old photographs because actually they say oh actually yes they are a lot better doctor because the improvement happens over a course of many months they often forget how bad they were yes that's Um, certainly been my experience it's a very crucial part of the process i think i think you're right and you've, you've, uh, Simon, you've also sent a series of three very nice photographs, which very nicely demonstrate the evolution of the veins after sclerotherapy. Do you want to talk us, to us, talk us through those three? Yes. So, so, so like, like Zoda, I think I, I tend to spread vein injectors out sort of three monthly. Um, so these, these are sort of three months apart. So this is sort of from month zero to month, month six, as it were. Um, this is a nasty set of veins in the inner structure of the thigh with some associated reticular veins. So I've injected the reticular veins and then the thread veins. At first look, I suppose the, scan, the photograph at three months, some of those larger veins are still apparent, although they're less marked. But if you zoom in closely, you can see it's almost like the little islands of um, yes. microthrombus in the veins, which is resolving. And then at that point, there was a further round of injections to some of the smaller sort of telangiectatic veins with, I think, a very nice outcome at six months. Again, very if you nice. zoom in, you can see there are still some veins there. There are still yeah. some veins that you might be able to target, but it does become a, a bit of a law of diminishing returns. 
the smaller yeah. veins are harder to get into, they're harder to treat. Yes. Um, and she was she was very pleased with the outcome there. That's very kind. Yeah, that's very nice. That's a very nice. And thank you, Sun, for and you, Zola, for sharing your your photographs at short notice. I only gave uh, Zola and Simon 24 hours notice to hunt through their records. In fact, I think it was 12 hours notice. It wasn't very long. That's very good. To, um, you've been very generous with your time, Zola, Simon. I won't keep you too much longer, but um, you may know, and I'm sure you do, that some of the people who are watching this video have just completed or are in the process of completing uh, the vein care online course, which is theory. What advice would you give a person, a doctor, a nurse, a doctor or nurse, who is learning microsclerotherapy for the first time? or early in their journey of, of becoming a skilled practitioner. So what, what advice would you give? Yeah, I think as I sort of said before, when it comes to sclerosis, just remember, firstly, less is more. You can always walk away from a situation. Certainly yeah, it's a case of, you don't, yeah, if things don't look right with a vessel, stop injecting, come to another vessel. Um, it's a case of time will settle things down and you can always return to vessels at a later stage. Certainly some of the big, you know, the, you know, the big errors are made from people injecting too much in the wrong place um, and of a high concentration. So therefore you get the staining complications, you risk the ulceration complications as well. So I think certainly from, from one thing I sort of notice is ironically, the more I inject, the less volumes I seem to be using and actually the lower strengths I'm using. So certainly from that point of view, um, don't worry, when you, when you start getting very slick and in the right place, it's amazing how tiny a volume you actually need to get, to get, really, to get good results. But don't get disheartened, it's, it's, it's a learning curve, et cetera. Providing you follow the rules correctly, you won't make any serious errors front side and then you'll notice as time goes on, things, you know, your results just get better and better and they're easier to reproduce. Simon, where's the wisdom? I think the biggest thing is is frank discussions about realistic expectations. Yes. Um, uh, frequently, you get patients come through with both legs riddled with veins from thigh to ankle, and they're a bit of a heart sink, really, because you know it's going to take a lot of work to get things to get things right um, over over many sessions, and and it'll take some time before they they start to get happy with the appearance of the legs. So sometimes it's having a civil discussion, asking which part, I can't do all the leg, which part of the leg are you most worried about? And a lot of it for ladies is below the knee because they want to wear skirts again. And yes. and you can and just, just focus on smaller areas rather than, than trying to clear the whole leg in a session. I'm going to share with you my worst complication. Um, it's one that I remember, then I'll ask you to share yours, but I'll share mine first. My worst complication is a lady who came back after treatment and she developed some micro telangiectasia. She got some, uh, some very fine telangiectasia, matting is the term for it, isn't it? Telangiectic matting. She got a very nasty patch of telangiectic matting after her treatment. And when she came back, she was very angry with me. And the comment that she made was, and I never asked you to do that vein and um, my heart sank because obviously it's a recognized complication, but she said to me that she didn't want that bit done. So I'm very careful now uh, uh, that I am absolutely clear with the patient which veins they would like treated, and I don't treat any veins unless they specifically ask me to treat them. Um, we all get complications, but if you get a complication after treating something that the patient didn't specifically ask you to treat I think you're on, I, I was on difficult ground there and it was only after seeing the patient regularly and re-establishing that relationship that uh, we eventually parted on good terms the other interesting fact is that uh, she came back three years later and the telangiectic matting had all gone and she was extremely pleased so I learned another lesson from that which is don't retreat areas where you've got telangiectic matting leave them alone and they usually resolve of their own accord an initial disappointment and initial complaint might actually turn into a good result in the end simon your worst result your worst complication have you ever had any serious complications i've not had any anaphylaxis i i don't recall any any ulceration 
Uh, I have had staining. I have had um, matting. Um, yes, I think those but, are the two. Nothing, aren't they? nothing any more serious than that. One of one of the group pages that I do find very challenging. I've, I've got a couple of ladies who keep coming back with very minor veins who keep saying, I want that doing, I want that doing. And that I find very challenging to say, actually, you know what, these are pretty damn small, you know, very hard to see. I'm probably not going to be able to inject these to your satisfaction. And that group almost, I, I don't know whether they're truly body dysmorphic, but they are clearly very um, worried about the appearance of the legs, which on the face of it look pretty good. You would most people would be happy with the appearance. But I find those people very difficult to to put off and say no to treatment. So Ola, what's your experience of complications? Yeah, my experience, uh, well, yes. I, I will never forget the complication because yes, unlike Simon, who's been fortunate, I have had ulceration. Uh, now, what makes it even more memorable, it was ulceration in the wife of a consultant colleague. So therefore, it's one of those you sort of realise that, you know, these things can happen. And so, you know, just, yeah, take all the measures you can to try to reduce the chance of these happening. And I must admit, it was earlier on in, yeah, in my practice. So certainly the doses of sclerosins I was using then were was, you know, significantly higher than doses of sclerosins I'd use now. So I suspect in part that was part contributor to the fact that um, this lady developed a small ulcer. And the annoying thing is that they're quite painful. So certainly it was a case of, you know, sort of, although yes, it resolved over time, but it's one of those, you know, for, for, you know, for a good number of weeks to a month or so, you know, you know, this painful ulcer was there. When people describe ulcers after sclerotherapy, they're little tiny scabs and blisters, aren't they? They're not the horrible leg ulcers that you... No. No, they're, they're little painful scabs. Yeah. And they will inevitably heal up in somebody who you've selected appropriately with good circulation and no health problems. But as you say, they are very painful. They're very annoying. They will heal and leave a little small white dot. So they're cosmetically acceptable after sufficient time. But do, is your learning point from that complication that the concentration strength of the sclerosin was too high or that you injected too much volume or too, too uh, hard, too much pressure? I suspect, I suspect it's potentially a combination of all of those things, yeah. but I think sort of the, the easily correctable ones initially are, well, the ones you can easily correct for anyone is drop your strength and drop your volume. And then sort of the, uh, the technique, the pressure, et cetera, will improve as, as, yes. as you inject more and more, but yeah. certainly as I say, drop, drop, drop the strength. Um, yeah. yes, no matter what level of your training, et cetera, yeah. that, you know, that's something that you can manipulate and help reduce the chance of problems. Yes, I, I remember from, well, I know from, treat, from training people hands-on initially, when they get that blanch, they're so excited at watching the blanch area spread that they forget to stop. stop. And they just want to keep blanching a bigger, bigger, bigger area. They want to blanch the whole lot. And some t one of the things you have to say when you're watching an, a person early on in their experience is stop injecting now, go to a different point and inject small amounts small volumes under low pressure rather than try and blanch the whole thing at once. I, I think YouTube and Instagram, although they have some great uh, examples, video examples of blanching, some of our colleagues do get carried away when they're being filmed and they like to blanch the whole area in one go, particularly with foam. Uh, I see a lot of people injecting small little veins with foam very impressive on video. It, it, you get huge areas of blanching and they disappear. But I think uh, some practitioners and some patients may get the idea that they go instantly, that everything goes with one injection and that's it. And as you pointed out, both of you, you get, it looks worse before it looks better. Um, and there's a healing process in which you need to uh, manage the expectations. Thank you very much both of you for giving up your time today and um, look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.